Welcome back to SuperCloud 7, where we're exploring the next era of data platforms and the rise of intelligent data apps. We're with MK, his real name is a bit longer than that, EVP of NextGen Platform at Salesforce. Welcome, MK. Thank you, George. It's, it's a pleasure to meet you. Okay, so let's dive right in. The data clouds that have dominated the first wave um, of the industry have been designed to support the creation of analytic data products, such as ML models and BI dashboards. Salesforce Data Cloud is supposed to be a platform that supports a, a richer class of ap applications. Describe that class of applications for us and what it is about the platform that enables it to support something richer than a data product. Yeah, great question, George. I think, like you said, data products typically have been meant sort of for after exhaust signals, meaning you collect the signals, you kind of create these passive dashboards uh, or sort of ML things. Typically the challenge that has been, while it has served us a lot, the problem has been that these are often disconnected from your business platforms, meaning the data or the insights you have generated in these platforms are not being used in your sales, in your service, in your marketing easily. And so what data platform or rather data cloud tried to do is to really bridge that gap. We're trying to bridge the gap between sort of the CIOs running these data platforms with really the line of business users like our sales service marketers and others and make data really untrap the data in all of these and make it usable to all of these business users. And that's really the fundamental sort of uh, key point with Data Cloud. And also it's an active platform. What we mean by that is it's not a traditional platform where you just look at a dashboard. It will go generate alerts. It will go generate flows. It will trigger changes so that you can actually react to all of your data and insights. So um, explain what the role of like metadata is in up-leveling data, say from the, the strings that a database would care about to the things that a developer and a business cares about, and then how the integration with the rest of the Salesforce operational applications makes it possible to bridge, as you said, from the, the CIO or the data crowd, you know, back to the operations. Great question. So first thing is data can be obviously spread across your enterprise, right? It comes in many forms. And so with Data Cloud, we try to allow you to be able to bring that data very easily, whether it's batch streaming or real-time data. But in addition, we also have something called Zero Copy Network, where we expand it to be able to just point to the existing data warehouses and lake houses. But the key thing in all of it, regardless of how we bring the data, whether it's federated, whether it's ingested, it's important that we put a metadata layer on it so that we know, okay, this data is about orders. This is about sales. This is about a customer, right? And if you look at almost every enterprise in, in sort of the world, just a simple thing as who your customer is, is completely represented differently across all your systems. There is no one standardization of schema or metadata or anything. So with Data Cloud, we're able to then create that metadata, harmonize it so you can actually speak the same language then across all of your application services. And so metadata offers that powerful foundation for us to sort of normalize and harmonize across all of your sort of enterprise data. The zero copy partner network helps us then reuse a lot of that data and the metadata that's sitting in existing systems very, very easily into this. And I think it is also important to recognize there are multiple types of metadata, right? The basic ones are like, you have table names, you have column names, you have data types. And then the second level is you come up with the relationships. Okay, contact is related to accounts and opportunities, those kind of things, right? But the more interesting thing that we're also building is called the semantic kind of layer where we're giving a business kind of value on top of it to be able to create business understanding. Okay, this is what I mean by my sales ROI or my marketing campaign ROI, those kind of KPIs, metrics, and other kind of standardized definitions so that you can then standardize those as well across your entire, uh, entire sort of enterprise. Okay, that that's really helpful. So, in other words, if I, I'm I'm trying to sort of recap and and distill, it sounds like if the the metadata um, harmonizes all the data so that it's not just telling you what what the KPIs are, but who an individual customer is um, and how they're connected to their orders, 
even across systems, if you're federating out to Snowflake or Databricks, then a developer can build an application that reasons over all the meaningful things in their business. And then they can build, they can use the ML models that they might have built as standalone artifacts to predict, for instance, um, how a marketing campaign is going to perform. And it's then connected to the Salesforce operational apps. So it can learn from them too. That is a great example. Very recently, just last month, one of the largest automotive vendors, one of the large automotive vendors in Europe did this thing where they had data in their sales cloud, which was talking about their customers. But of course, they had a lot of other systems, including their website, which talks about their customers in forms of cookies and other kind of things. And they had other backend systems, which were talking about their inventory or what people have done. And within a matter of weeks, the business users, the salespeople in uh, in their company, in their automotive company, was able to create a lead score, a predictive lead score using our Einstein, uh, build your Einstein model functionality, using data cloud where they brought all that digital signals from their website, their backend signals from their backend sort of implementations and their sales cloud sort of customer information. And they were able to start predicting who is going to, who has a higher propensity to go buy and then they were going to actually go call those people and make the sale, right? So, so think about how much of this is unlocked. Before, it was split across multiple systems. It was not easily accessible. We've not only untrapped it, we've given the ability for predictive models to come on top of it and make it business user and in your line of business, in your sales flow, right? Uh, where flows can be triggered to say, this particular person has a high propensity to buy because they are now browsing your website. Maybe go call them. Right, maybe go uh, talk to them. That that's a very powerful thing that our platform now enables. So um, one way to think about this is it's not rip out your existing Snowflake or Databricks. It's put in this new layer for the customer oriented data, and we'll harmonize that along with your existing data, and then by connecting it with the outcomes in the operational apps, like like the who's who's uh, has the highest propensity to buy or um, to move someone through a, a lead funnel. Like you're sort of creating a value add layer on top of the existing data infrastructure um, where it's, it's no longer just standalone data products, but these products are now part of a broader application. It just, these operational applications now have richer analytic components. Is that one way of looking at it? hundred um, percent. And I think, what we have done is four things, right? One is you can certainly reuse all of your existing. In fact, in some ways, data cloud lifts all the boats in the sense that you may have spent a lot of money building all of these data platforms, but your LOB business orgs are probably not seeing the value. With data cloud, now you can connect it very easily. And then every single investment you've done with your Snowflake, with your Databricks or Azure, et cetera, is now immediately valuable to your business users. Uh, and second thing is, it's not just about, like you said, passive data. It's really about making it active so that you can now go trigger actions for all of your sort of business audiences. And third is a lot of these systems typically didn't store web engagement or other kind of data. Now we can pull that also in addition to this and really kind of enrich your overall profile of what the user is doing across your business. Very simple example, uh, in Salesforce, first of all, we thought we had 200 plus million visitors when we did data cloud through our unification we realized it was 100 million people just at different IDs. There may be three different Georges in our system, right? But that's also important because I know George as a person probably watched this trailhead, right? Bought this product or show some interest in my website. And so we are able to collect all of that into that 360 view. And also today, if a high value account is there and you kind of browse our websites and others, we actually are able to slack, send a Slack alert to the salesperson to say, you know, your high value account they actually browse these products on the website. Maybe you should go have a conversation with them on this particular topic. See the power that it's able to do, not just unification, not just sort of harmonization of this data, but be able to bring all of them and alert using your existing sort of data infrastructure and augmenting it. Okay. So, so let's talk about um, Gen AI, which is not just the biggest productivity boost we've had to software, yeah. all, all sort of stages of the software development lifecycle, but, but to end users too. But let's right. go to the personas that first that use the data platform. Um, how might Gen AI um, change the role of data engineering beyond like what you've already done to up level it with all the metadata that sort of makes 
building or eliminates a lot of the pipelines that normally would be built? How, how would Gen AI help a data engineer? Great question. So I think to me, uh, there's two parts to Gen AI. One is like, uh, we call it like AI for data and data for AI kind of thing. Right? We all know how much important data is for AI and that is used sort of in the applications we'll talk about it. Now, when we talk about AI for data, these are Gen AI to be able to help with all of your data work. Uh, and so there are many, many, many places. Like for example, how could you come up with using Gen AI? How could we create transformations much more easily? Now, these could be data transformations. It could be API transformations. Regardless, uh, today, a lot of time is spent in really cleansing data, in moving data, right? In kind of adapting the transformations. And so we look at Gen AI as really helping with that sort of task quite a bit. Uh, a classical example is if you have an ETL pipeline, you should be able to express what it is. Uh, if you have a flow that orchestrates across data pipelines, you should be able to express in simple language what you want to do. Uh, and more recently, we've also looked at some of the mapping. Like I talked about how harmonization is an important theme, but that's often the hardest because in a lot of cases, your data may not exactly be uh, easy to say, oh, this field, how do I map here? And this is kind of, again, where Gen AI is very useful. There's another big effort that we are doing, which is we often, when we talk about Gen AI, people only look at that looking at the data, like RAG and everything else is all about data. But we believe metadata is also equally important. So we use Gen AI techniques to go index all the metadata. So that when I ask a question, uh, particularly with like all data cloud thing, like I talked about, you're going to have thousands of tables. Each table may have hundreds of columns. We're talking about like, imagine the explosion of metadata that you have. And so it's really, really, really hard for anyone to quickly know, okay, which table and which column should I even look at if I want to transform, if I want to use it in my application. And so we have techniques we've built where we now index this metadata as well, along with some sample data. And that we use in our RAC techniques to be able to even figure out which tables make sense for us to be able to use in, let's say, let's take a simple example, like a marketing campaign. If I ask saying, find me all the segment of adults living in New York City who have purchased something, this probably will touch 15 different tables. How do you even know what tables to start with? And that's okay. the Gen AI for metadata can help. This is really interesting because this is the way you're describing this flow. There's a, the, the human developer is in the loop, and so over time, the the system can get smarter about the choices that it's offering or the options that it's offering. If Absolutely. I'm understanding, so but let's take this now. That same knowledge of the metadata and the underlying data, and let's talk about the business user in right. the different functions that want, might want to interact with the data more naturally than you know the pre-built dashboards. Yep. So this is there's there's been a an assumption that BI would be totally revolutionized sort of instantaneously by LLMs, but it's not so easy as you were describing to map a, a user and a natural language intent to the underlying SQL. So we've heard from a bunch of BI vendors that you really need this metric definition layer. Correct. Um, what are you working on in that area? And and um, what's possible in terms of natural language interaction with data without that metric definition layer for an end user? Yep. And what's possible with it? Yeah, great question. First of all, I feel uh, the analytics layer is probably the hardest in Jenna. And I'll tell you why, because if you tell somebody, let's take the CEO, he's saying, hey, what's going to be my sales for next quarter? And you give a number, that number better be accurate, right? Like you don't want AI hallucinating and saying, yeah, I think it's going to be 20% or it's maybe 30%, right? And so it's really important we get that right. And so there is like, you should, you should look at it in two ways. One is explanation of metrics that we have. Gen AI is awesome at it. And we already have that sort of working, right? On all of your existing sort of data thing that you may have created. And then there is the second part is how can you use Gen AI to go create those metrics as well? Uh, and that's kind of where Tableau Einstein and many kind of things that we're working on. And part of that effort is also standardizing that metric layer, or we also call that semantic models. Because uh, again, we are taking a platform first approach because what you've seen in the industry is semantic models tend to be only with the analytical layer. And often it's not usable by the rest of your applications at all. 
right? And so it's often sitting with our data analysts and they are creating models and that's the dashboard you can see. What about like, why can't I use the ROI in my sales sort of thing? Why can't I go trigger an alert if my uh, thing is gonna change, my ROI is changing and so on. And so we are sort of bringing that metric layer with data cloud on a common platform. So it's gonna power all our analytical experiences, all our dashboards and everything else with Gen AI, but it's also gonna power analytics, uh, power AI, all of our co-pilot and agent experiences, as well as automation so you can go trigger flows and building those new applications as well uh, using the same model. Okay, so so let's pivot to, to agents. So you gave me a, an opening there. Um, so um, first, just to set, like level set, what what is an agent? What does an agent do? Great question. So agents, you should think of it as the next level of evolution of Gen AI. Right. We started off obviously with predictive AI, then we kind of like with Gen AI, we kind of created co-pilots where you can some ask questions. Agents becomes the next level of evolution where it can start doing more complex tasks by kind of decomposing them and calling other either APIs or other backend agents to really compose them together. Uh, so that's really what an agent is. And a very simple example, if you want to give, is typically in the service case, a digital agent. So you could go to a website and you should be able to say, hey, what's the status of my order? And that could be decomposed into 15 different things behind to say, okay, who's this person? What order have they actually ordered? Has it shipped, not shipped, and why? Right. So you can see how many complex things it has to probably do. That's what an agent can quickly do. Okay. You also laid out nicely some of the key building blocks. It sounds like you're going to need it's not just access to raw data, but you're going to need uh, data that has a semantically um, enhanced or defined so that you can reason over it. So you know what an order is, and it's not, you know, some right. three-letter acronym in a, in 50,000 SAP tables. That's right. So um, maybe help put the pieces together for us about data cloud with semantically, you know, defined data so it speaks the same language as as the business and the model, and then the connectors that MuleSoft, you know, provides, and then the common data model and workflow definitions from Salesforce itself and how agents would interact with all those pieces and with each other. Great question. So I think agents really bring everything together, right? So we talked about sort of the data cloud pieces, which can bring data either through ingestion or through federation, and we can create sort of the metadata layers on top, uh, and we can also do the harmonization, unification, all that, give you that 360 view and create the semantic models as well, right? To give you KPIs, metrics, and all that stuff. Now, this is great if you're able to bring all that data together. Now, also in the same enterprise, you're going to have tons of other applications which have sort of APIs, which have higher level sort of API semantics, or maybe there are old applications you built maybe with .NET or others which don't even have an API. And this is where things like RPA and others that MuleSoft provides can kind of help. So if you look at it as a uh, sort of a parallel thing where you do data integration, again, you can use MuleSoft connectors and others, create these rich models. And also you have API level integration for opening up your enterprise applications, if you may. Now, regardless, they are all part of the platform. So that means that same metadata is available throughout the platform. And you now have other things also in the platform like Flow, like Apex. Right uh, and and sort of other entities which are also have metadata in them. Now agents, what they do is they are able to access all of this stuff, whether it's data, whether it's APIs, whether it's actions like Flow, Apex, and other kind of things because they have metadata. Now it's important to know for an agent what you can do is create these notions of topics, and you can say, okay, for doing an order, these are the set of things you may need. And then a topic would give the description that this is about order fulfillment. Or you may have a set of things to say, this is about order status uh, and so on. And then a collection of those topics would be about a co-pilot or an agent that says, this is about a service agent, right? Which can talk about orders and status and all that. Or you may have a sales agent, which is all about SDRs, which can sort of help figure out what are the knowledge articles I need to go pull in so that I can uh, educate the user so I can actually make a sale. So think of actual building blocks of you have data, structured or unstructured with semantic models. You have MuleSoft with APIs and access with RPAs. And then you have the platform with all the metadata with the actions, data, API actions. And then the co-pilot agents with topics 
to segregate which makes sense for what roles. And then you have the agents on top that can then interact either with end customers or with employees to be able to then orchestrate across. The agent, what it's doing there, if I ask a question, it needs to figure out the intent of the question. And then it needs to figure out, okay, which topics would make sense? And then how do you chain all of the APIs or actions within those topics to really create the right answer? And then have the session context to know, okay, what is the user doing so I can actually answer subsequent questions based on the initial responses? So that's how this whole sort of layer is built up. But the key thing in all of this, again, this is why Salesforce is differentiated from everyone else, is we look at it as an open platform, right? You have your existing data assets, not an issue. We can integrate with it. You have your existing app assets, we can integrate with it, our MuleSoft, right? And then all of these uh, things that we are talking about with our API, semantic models, and agents, then plug in into your line of work. So it's not some standalone thing somewhere. It's in your line of work for your service, for your sales, for your marketers, right? For your commerce and so on. So what makes all this hang together? Um, if if an agent is is sort of like a, a microservice that can sort of think a little bit on its own, what is the framework that um, m makes this herd of, of microservices um, coherent in terms of aligning them with overall corporate objectives, providing guardrails, um, and sort of an operational framework, and then sort of outcomes to measure and improve individual ones and and also to align them to the to the larger objectives how does that yeah this is a great question uh, because this is often overlooked in all of these things uh, so uh, you actually asked probably two or three sort of questions in that uh, in that one so the first thing is to we give you the control. First of all, metadata is the backbone for all of this stuff. And I talked about how we index the metadata, right? Uh, semantically, we use that as well. Metadata is important because metadata tells you which APIs even make sense or not make sense, right? And so we have an extensible way as an agent for you to go define these topics, create the descriptions for those topics very clearly so the LLMs can interpret what it is, and then give the set of actions. And you can restrict to saying, okay, only these actions are allowed and so on. And it's possible for you to also put all the rules on who could even access these actions or not. You don't, we probably shouldn't get the access to go update some uh, sales salary information, right? It should be restricted as an example. And so you can put all of the permission sets and others and role, role-based access on all of these actions as well and limit the knowledge. Like you don't want a service agent to be able to give you random uh, knowledge about uh, like a sales or marketing, right? So you want to restrict. So you could do all of that. And that is triggered by the metadata that you define for those agents, the topic, the descriptions, the actions, the data that they should have access to, and the user permissions on top of those. That's one set of it. And then the second set is, you also have the ability through what we call as our prompt studio to be able to further refine how these agents should behave. So you can say rules such as, I want you to be, uh, I don't, I want you to behave in a certain way, or I want you to use my brand voice in a certain way. Like this is how my company will talk to my customer, use those, right? Don't say bad things or whatever it is that you want to do. We have all the trust rules, but you can put on top of it, your own company rules, your own brand promises, brand value, brand voice, all of that stuff on top. And that is completely extensible. And then the third part of it is very important is feedback. There is two levels of feedback, which is if you're an employee thing, where an employee looks at the answers and they're like, yes or no, or whether they actually use your response that the agent sends. And similarly on the consumer side, whether the users are happy with that uh, agent responses or not. And then there's a second level, uh, second tier, which is after all that stuff, did the user actually purchase the product or the user actually are happy with the case resolution, right? And that's the outer loop. So in both of these cases, the inner loop, all that feedback also lands back in your data cloud. So as an admin, you have full visibility into saying, how is your AI actually working? Is it boosting your employees' productivity or not, right? And But more importantly, this is what other AI systems don't have is the outer loop, right? Did your sales actually close? Did your service cases actually reduce, right? How is your marketing? Did you actually touch? Did people engage with you based on what you did? that outer loop signals is also available in the same data cloud. So you can cross tie that together to say, okay, I used AI, I enabled the agents for these particular roles. 
this is my actual outcome. My sales improved, my service uh, CSAT improved, my marketing reach improved, all that is possible. Okay, MK, I think on, we're gonna have to, we're gonna have to call a timeout there because we got to leave some more topics on agents for our next conversation. Sounds but great. That was, that was uh, really, really educational. It took us all the way from sort of data products to an army of agents and uh, gave us an outline. All right. On that note, thanks for watching. We'll be right back with more from SuperCloud 7, live and on demand from Palo Alto. Thank you. Thank you.